Hello, my friends. I feel absolutely awful today and can't really record anything of quality, so today we instead are going to make a tier list of all the StarCraft II characters. I found this on Tier Maker, so if it's missing anybody, then it's not my fault. It's who's ever made it. Um, yeah, let's just get straight on into this, because there is a lot of characters. One thing I'm going to mention is that this is going to be their StarCraft II appearances only. So, for example, if we get Jimmy John Rayner, you know, this bad lad who uh, has the top of his head cut off, it's, uh, he, we don't get to do what he did in StarCraft 1. That doesn't count. It's just StarCraft 2 because we'll do StarCraft 1 at some point later. And a lot of the characters are very different between StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2. So first comes first is Abathur. Abathur, I think, is one of the best characters that was added to Heart of the Swarm. He was super interesting. Basically, everybody likes him. And I'm really happy with everything they did with him. He's a lot more interesting than a character, for example, Isha. Isha's really lame. She's really boring. Abathur, on the other hand, says a lot of fascinating things, talks about the evolution of the swarm, uh, uh, exists as a nice link to the Overmind. He talks about the Overmind a decent amount and how the Overmind created him and that kind of stuff. And I think that's cool. I think that is really interesting. As a result, I'm going to put him in A tier. A real strong start. Not just because his name starts with A. We're not going to we're not going to do one of those tier lists. Next up is our boy Alarak. Now, Alarak, I think, is kind of like Abathur in a way, where he was a surprise character added in to the mission, or rather, added into the campaign, this one Legacy of the Void. And I, they did a kind of cool bamboozle, if you remember, where they made you think originally he was going to be an antagonist. You were going to be fighting against him constantly throughout the entire thing, because in the first mission, Forbidden Weapon, the first Purifier mission, you fight against him, he's the one that's controlling the mothership, and then he's on your side. Not Well, not really on your side, but you know what I mean. He's like uh, pseudo-aligned, and he acts as a very good foil to Artanis. And I think that's what Artanis needs. If Artanis is the paladin, then Alarak is the blackguard. And as a result, I think it makes things very interesting. I'm going to add it to an A tier, because he does that role very well. Amon, I think, is a bad villain. The things that he says are often very, they don't really work with each other. Like, he talks about constantly how he wants to end the infinite cycle, which is the cycle of creating new Zel Naga by taking a purity of form and purity of essence and smashing them together. And then he makes the hybrid by creating a purity of form and purity of essence and smashing them together. What? What? <laughs> His entire plot doesn't make sense. He's a poor villain. He has no personality. You can't tell me what Amon likes. You can't tell me what he dislikes except for the infinite cycle. <laughs> and I think that's really lame. He's uh, unfortunately just undeveloped in a way that you can't relate to what he wants. You can't feel for him. And he doesn't have like a con you don't he doesn't have one of those plans. That you're like, oh, this guy's smart. Nothing like that. So Artanis is going to be, I think, uh, Legacy of the Void Artanis is a character that acts as a conduit for more interesting characters. He himself, almost all he does is give out one-liners and talk about unity. And I honestly think that that's kind of boring. I don't dislike Artanis, that's the thing. He does a lot of great stuff. He it acts as a bridge between the Terran the Zerg, and the Protoss, which is obviously very admirable. He's always fighting for good and justice, which is good, good, good. It's not the most interesting thing in the world, and that's because they have to have characters like Alarak be the kind of foil, the more interesting parts. So I can't give him a super high tier, but I can't give him a bad one either because he's a good dude that does a lot of great things. So I'm going to put him in B tier. Carolina Davis. So Davis is the attempt at making a new villain at the end of it. She is the antagonist of Nova Covert Ops. I think the biggest issue is that she as a character only exists for three missions. And as a result, you learn very, very, very little about her. And similarly to Amon, as a result, it becomes hard to relate to her. It becomes hard to 
like really care about what she's doing and why she's doing it. And her plan doesn't seem incredibly smart for the long term. If she, she feels like Mengsk was unfairly assassinated and then her killer was put into power with Valerian. And I can, uh, that is an interesting basis for a plot line that simply cannot be explained well enough in three missions. I'm going to put her in C tier, not because she's bad, but because there, the choice to take a nine mission campaign and only have her be the antagonist for three of the missions is a bit weird. Dahaka is an interesting character. The, I think that the primal Zerg as a faction would be much worse without him. He definitely joining up is interesting in that he... I guess he's just a good representation of the group and how they're very opportunist. They are weirdly self-centered, but at the same time, they're packs because they're packs for selfish reasons instead of selfless ones, which is actually kind of an interesting dynamic that doesn't exist like in nature very often. I think that he does a good job of explaining the Primal Zerg. I think he has an interesting personality, though he is very one note. So I'm going to put him in B tier. <laughs> Our boy Donnie. Donnie is wonderful. I actually think that he is one of the best characters in StarCraft. Every time that he pops up, it is just a joy. He's great on the screen. Everything he says is dumb. He acts as a propaganda piece to see through the eyes of the civilians. Like, what are they being fed? Why do some of them believe in the Dominions and other don't? And he provides a very good example of there's definitely a lot of people that are falling for this propaganda type stuff. And then there's a bunch of people who's looking this and like, are you kidding? Why are these idiots falling for this propaganda? And as a result, I think he's a really good character. And of course, the fact that he so devoutly believes in that propaganda, I think is also wonderful. And then his uh, subsequent mental breakdown. I, he has one of the better story arcs in StarCraft. I'm sorry. He's great. Like he's, he's hilarious, but he's also just well-written. Okay, Egon Stepman. Here's the thing. Egon basically does nothing in StarCraft. You can talk to him like three times in all of Wings of Liberty, and then they put him in the Belly of the Beast mission where he's actually pretty funny. And then he never shows up again except in co-op, which is not canon. So I don't think that I can use co-op as a... No, I'm, I'm going to say that this is... Starcraft 2 canonical lore what things that actually happened and co-op didn't so I can't use <laughs> I can't use the Gary version which means I got to put him in C tier All, in the same reason for Davis where there might be an interesting character here but there's just not enough time to explore them they didn't take the opportunity wait uh, I guess we have to use co-op of Sergeant Hammer Sergeant Hammer has no personality I can't say anything about this character why are they here? Why isn't Gary here if Sergeant Hammer is here? This doesn't seem fair. Who made this tier list? <laughs> uh, okay. So, Isha. I actively dislike Isha. I There's not a whole lot of characters in StarCraft that I really dislike. And that, you know what, I guess Hammer deserves C tier because C is like the, I'm very average on them tier. D is not, it is like, actively negative and I think that Isha is of the player characters the people that are on your side the only one the only one that I truly do not enjoy talking to she doesn't really have much of value to say her entire personality being like split off from Kerrigan to act as a hard drive or whatever is weird and it like stops coming up pretty quickly in the game file, she's literally just called Zerg Adjutant because <laughs> that's what they think about her. She's just the same as that stupid robot that tells you to mine more minerals. I think she's boring. She's really boring. And she's designed to be boring. Which, why don't you design a character to be interesting instead? Janara is an interesting character. Now, obviously, the... This is Janara, right? Yeah, this is Malash, so this is Janara. The fact that she is specifically designed to lose is interesting. 
especially because in Nova Covert Ops, Alarak is the one sending her out with the intention of her losing. And that is a very fascinating thing to think about because he's trying to just, he's basically giving Janara trial by fire to make her a progressively better commander at the expense of Nova's forces, even if Nova doesn't lose because he doesn't actively want Nova to lose. He just wants to utilize the opportunity to make his Taldorim better. Now, Janara as a personality is kind of like, eh, whatever. But I think that she gets a place up simply because of how Alarak uses her in the storyline. And I know that's a bit weird. Yeah, that's pretty darn weird. But I think that it improves both Alarak and Janara as characters because of the thing that Alarak does. If it were, if she were just on her own as a Taldorim person, it was beaten over and over. And it was like, oh, I'll get you next time, Nova covered up. And then <laughs> she would fight her again. Uh, I think that she would be like a D tier character. But because of this, because of this Alarak plot, this big brain Alarak plot, I think it's pretty good. Carax is a character I like a lot. So I think that a it's, it's not an uncommon storyline of the breaking of casts or whatever, where someone is born into a position where they are limited in what they can do where society is like yeah you can't you're you this is what you can do and you're not one of the great people like us and then they proceed to be like oh yeah you want to bet bro and then they just proceed to completely shatter said system because they prove that so, they're so amazing Carax did that for the protoss and he did it in a pretty good way he built carriers <laughs> i mean he also did a lot of other incredible tech stuff I think that my biggest problem with him is that he did like everything on his own to the point where it kind of feels unrealistic. I wish that character as, or I wish that Carax as a character had like a support staff of background engineers that he was working with on the solar core, was working with on the artifact and that sort of thing. So that it felt like he was more of a representation of the entire cast. They wouldn't have to have like personalities, just like even just seeing the engineer people working under him in the background in the Spear of a Dune would be very interesting. And I think it would lend more credence to the fact that all Protoss are valued based on what they can do instead of how they were born. So I'm going to knock him down a little bit for that, but I think that his personality, he's like so nerdy and fun. He's charming. He kind of reminds me of the Protoss version of Swan, and I like Swan a lot. So I'm going to put him in a real solid B tier. Kate Lockwell acts, I like foils in terms of storytelling where you have a character who is very rigid and unchanging, but larger than life and powerful, and then you have a foil to them. So that's kind of, that's the way that Alarak and Artanis work together. It's also the work, way that Donnie and Kate work together. And as a result, I think that she makes Donnie a lot more interesting. However, she herself is not the most interesting character. I do like the time that Valerian flirts with her. I think that's hilarious, and I totally ship it. But... For the most part, I think that she acts as like a opening and ending to Donnie's, to Donnie's uh, masterpieces. That's what we'll call them. And as a result, she does a good job at that. She deserves B tier. Good luck on your dating, Kate. I believe. Kerrigan. Oh gosh. So I've said this before, but there's too many Kerrigans. There. She doesn't have a personality. She has like 12 personalities. And it completely shifts depending on what the authors and the writers want. And that really gets to me. I wanted Kerrigan to be cool. And at times she really is. But then other times she just like snaps real quickly to being completely whiny. Or she just murders people for no reason. Or then she's like, oh no, I, I would never murder anyone. We have to make sure that our drone fighters are fighting. No one's going to die in this one. We got like, it's so just randomly back and forth. I don't 
like how inconsistent she is all across the board. And it's not like a, I'm changing because I'm learning. It's like a, whoa, well, just like, it's like a seismograph on a Richter scale seven earthquake. It's just going crazy with what her personality is. And I do like some of that personality. I'm going to put her in C tier because some of her I like, but other parts just infuriate me. And the fact that they, I just want her to be a consistent character. And the ending is, you know what? No, the ending sucks. She's like part of the big problem with the epilogue. <laughs> So Naga Kerrigan's boring, and she's part of that. Bye, Kerrigan. So this is Malash. Malash, I'm going to give a solid C tier, simply because he um, he doesn't do much. He's not that interesting. He lied to the Taldorim that they would be assimilated, or they'd be transformed into hybrid. And that was really it. And I can't, I can't be like, oh, that's real fascinating. It's not. He just, he kind of died. He just acted as a roadblock. So that Alarak himself would not start out as the High Lord of the Taldorim. Matt, I think, is one of the better characters that was added to StarCraft II. He kind of serves a little bit of the role as the Magistrate from StarCraft I, the player that's like hanging out with Jim. Unfortunately, I know that lore-wise, it's not possible for him to have been that because he was like a medevac driver, or a dropship driver, excuse me, and then he became that, so he couldn't have been there from the beginning. But I think he's a real good support character that almost acts as a player stand-in, and then he grows into his own character as time goes on, right? Like, he starts out as this guy that's controlling the Hyperion and Rainer's Raiders, which is already a very high amount of... Uh, authority given to him, but he eventually just complete or shows his competence over and over as a fleet commander, and as a result, rises through the ranks and becomes one of Valerian's most trusted people. And it feels very natural the way that he does that. And he, as a person, doesn't change. And also, his relationship with Mirahan is hilarious, and I love it. Mengsk is bad in StarCraft 2. I hate saying it, because StarCraft 1 Mengsk is amazing. He's one of my favorite characters. And then he just gets washed down into a boring antagonist for everybody. He doesn't get any of those redeeming factors. He doesn't get the I'm saving the Confederacy from incompetence in the Zerg Swarm at no matter the cost. He doesn't get the, yeah, the things I do are bad, but I unified everybody. He's just rude, mean, and evil. Which doesn't even make that much sense. Because, like, the last time that Jim and Mengsk really, like, talked to each other, Jim saved Mengsk in StarCraft 1. Right from the UED arresting. And then, for some reason in StarCraft 2, the next thing we see is that he put, like, a billion dollar bounty out on Jim Raynor, and there's, like, it doesn't make any sense. He's just like a Saturday morning cartoon villain for no reason. And it's a shame because he's one of the best StarCraft characters in StarCraft 1. I'm putting him in C tier because I can't I can't put him on A on tier. I just can't. Mirahan is hilarious. She doesn't do a whole lot, but she is very consistent and it kind of makes sense that you like randomly pop up or whenever you randomly need this help, this mercenary group is like, yeah, give us some enough money and we'll help out. Also, I really like your Matt Horner. Can I have one? And I think that she's, she's fun. She's not really impactful. She's not super well written or anything, but that's fine. I think that B tier is a fine tier for a character like this. Given that other characters are in C tier because they didn't have much time for development and Mirahan has about the same amount of time. I think that's pretty, it's pretty solid. Uh, as I said, I'm not doing co-op stuff, so whatever. Morales, she doesn't have a personality. Uh, Narud. I, I don't know why they did what they did with him. It feels like, it feels like in Wings of Liberty they had ideas for Narud, and then they just completely dropped them. He is, he's kind of like Amon where he's stereotypically evil, 
The reason that I'm giving him higher tier than Amon, though, is simply because he is more competent. You know, he's the one that made the hybrid, for example. And the hybrid may have all died to the Spear of a Dune and stuff, but they are pretty darn strong. Like, they are army killers in a lot of circumstances, and he made them. He manipulated the Dominion to being on his side, but we don't get to see a lot of that stuff. We don't get to see, like, he was the head of Mobius Corps, who is the people that we were trying to get the artifact with, or give the artifact pieces to, but there's not really a huge, like, negative repercussion to that. And there should have been, right? If we collected all the artifact pieces for them, there should have been some reason that Nerud was the head of that. Or, yeah. But it just, it never came up. And then he comes up again in Heart of the Swarm. And then he comes up again in the epilogue. And it's just, it feels kind of like, it feels like three unconnected stories. It feels like there's no... If the Mobius thing had come up later, it could have been more interesting, but it didn't. I don't know. It feels like a waste. They could have done a lot more with him and his scheming. Er, scheming. He's not a skeever. That's in, that's in Skyrim. His scheming. Nova is a character who is weird to me because I don't like fan service. I think that unless, unless it's symmetrical. If it's an entire universe where everything is fan service, then I'm just like, whatever. It At that point, that is how reality goes. It's not pandering. It's just stupid fun. But if it's just like one character out of an entire franchise that is getting super fan servicey, it feels super out of place to me. And that's what they do with Nova a lot. Like, go watch the cutscenes in Nova Covert Ops and count the number of butt shots. It's actually really high. They just constantly camera on her butt. And it's like, you sure about that, Chief? <laughs> well, wait a moment. Why aren't we doing that with Jim Rayner? Or, you know, those big Tychus booties. I, I feel like it's not fair. If it were symmetrical, it would be better. But that's not her whole character. And I actually think that what she went through in Nova Covert Ops is kind of interesting. The idea that she is the reason that the Zerg were invaded everything because she was mind-controlled. But at the same time, she was, like, mind-controlled, so she doesn't really have any agency in it. It's not like she made a mistake and has to fix it. It's like... She got hijacked. She got indoctrinated and had to fix it. So I don't think it was the best story. Um, I don't know. I don't dislike her, but I can't say a whole lot of positive things about her either. I do. I'm more net positive than I am neutral about her, though. So I'm going to put her in B tier, but it is a lower B tier than someone like Karax or Artanis, where these guys are kind of higher up in the tier. Nova's definitely lower. I'm not putting, I'm not really putting these in order. It's just the order that I put them in. But yeah, there's definitely a gradient here between this and this. Jim Rayner. I like him. I like him. He's a good character. I think that they tried some things with him and then they really wimped out. For example, the alcoholism subplot in Wings of Liberty. What well, it came up and then. It kind of, it doesn't get dropped. It does technically get resolved. However, it does not get resolved in an interesting way. It's just kind of like, okay, I won't drink anymore. And then it gets brushed under the corner. There's never like a mission, for example, where Jim screws everything up because he is an alcoholic and that gives him, you know, that I think that's the type of thing that would have been needed to really bring him up as a character where he's drowning in his sorrows. He sends the boys out on a thing. They're like, I don't know about this, Jim. He's like, don't worry, this will work. And then because he like starts drinking during it, a bunch of raiders die or something. And then he's like, oh, oh crap. And then like maybe he even starts drinking more after that, but then Matt and, or Tychus or someone or even just a whole big intervention then comes and is like, hey bud, you can't do that. If this is how Rainer's Raiders get... Like, it was real close to being something like that, but they didn't have it have any in-game significance. And as a result, it had a lot less impact. So I'm going to put him in B tier. He's a good guy. Obviously, he's done a lot of great stuff. He has some really good scenes. 
but I feel like they never want, they wanted him to be like such a good protagonist main character that they didn't actually sit down and be like, okay, he can have some flaws. And I wish that they did because he would have been a lot more relatable. Rigel is like the most boring character. He tries to do the Artanis thing of making one-liners, but his one-liners aren't very good. Artanises are actually pretty decent a lot of the time, and the king of one-liners is when Carax goes into his mission, uh, the carrier mission, and he starts trying to do the Artanis thing, and he's adorable about it. Rigel, on the other hand, he really tries to do that, and he's just not as interesting. I don't, I don't enjoy him. Rohan is a gracious grandma. I don't like her as a character. She seems like all she does is complain. I understand why she is there. However, I don't like anything that she does. She's stubborn. She's annoying. I think she's. <laughs> I don't know why they decided to make like a extremist boomer as a character and put her in there. Like the, if you asked uh, R slash teenagers what a boomer was like and they weren't grounded in reality, this is the character they would come up with. It's not, uh, it just, it feels so unrealistically stubborn and rude. It's like Karen Persaud. I don't like her. She's, uh, she's not a Karen, I guess, but I don't like her. Solendus, on the other hand, I am pretty positive with. She doesn't do a whole lot. That's actually my biggest problem with her is I thought she would get a larger role in Legacy of the Void, and then she's just MIA for the entire thing. The things we do see about her, the first impression that you get when you fight against her with the Purifier Mothership thing is that even though she's fighting against Jim, she's incredibly respectful to him. And I find that fascinating. I really like that. She's obviously kind of a Artanistan, but in a good way. And she really respects Jim as a result, but is like, I have to do this duty. Someone's going to have to do it. And either A, I respect you enough to uh, believe that you'll be able to get the job done on your own. Or B, I will fight you, but I completely am like, okay, you're going to be competent. I'm going to give you the respect you deserve. Let's try this. But I think that I'm doing the right thing here. I like that a lot. It's like lawful, good, militant. Not militant, but uh, militaristic. And... When you are playing that in the form of Artanis, it's kind of like, yeah, of course this is the right thing to do. But when you fight against it, it's more like, oh, that's interesting. It is inter It always feels wrong to be fighting against Solendus, in my opinion, because of that. Stukov, oh man. Stukov is a character that's really hard to separate between StarCraft 1 and StarCraft 2. If this were both, I would be putting him in S tier. Instead, I'm going to put him in A tier. He is, once again, a character that is quite a bit of fun. He says his dialogues are very enjoyable. He's competent. He's incredibly competent at all points in time. He often acts as a stand-in commander for Kerrigan. Like, in terms of military prowess, he might actually be better than Kerrigan in the swarm. She, he might actually be the best commander in the swarm in many ways which is interesting, and the fact that he's, like, trying to create a society for the infested Terran I think is interesting. He just doesn't get a lot of voice lines, though. He never shows up in Legacy of the Void until the epilogue. He shows up very late in StarCraft II Heart of the Swarm. And as a result, I can't make him any higher. But I think that every time that he does show up, it is well done and good. Swan I like a lot. I think that the things... If you go back and you, like, listen to all of his dialogues, A, he's a lot of fun, he's funny, he's got a bunch of personality, and he is very relevant. The things he talks about, the uh, growth of it, his moving over from the Kelmore and Combine over to Rainer's Raiders. He's got a very natural, well-done story. Well, I guess it's not a story, it's a backstory. And the way that he acts is pretty good. He doesn't have a character arc, really, though. That is the biggest thing with him, like... He kind of is statically Swan, but, you know, he's built Swan tough, and I think that's pretty good. Phoenix is another character. I think that Phoenix is the best written character in Legacy of the Void. Or rather, I should call him Talandar. I should be respectful and call him Talandar because 
that's who he is. And I really think that the storyline of Div or you know, it's basically a robot rights thing, right? It's the idea of individualism for what we don't traditionally think as individuals and that's going to be more and more relevant as time goes on for us and I think that it's cool that Blizzard took a crack at that story and I don't think they did a bad job so I'm gonna put him up in A tier simply because I find that storyline fascinating I find the idea of a character that has all the or it has all the memories of someone else and comes to the realization that all the things in his head are not actually who he is, but at the same time will become the foundation of who he is to be really interesting and something that is not... It, like, you don't see that in media very often. You inherit someone else's memories and you need to build a personality off of that that is uniquely your own. That's very hard to express, and it's a cool story idea, and I think they did a solid job with it. Good job, Phoenix. Or, Talendar. Talendar. Gonna be... I gotta be respectful. Tosh is cool. Man, Tosh is really cool. I like him. He's He doesn't show up for very often, which is why I can't give him more. But he's just cool, man. He's fun. He's like, hey, brother. We got some Reapers. And it's like, yeah, Tosh, we do. You're awesome. <laughs> like, how could... If you're going for pure lore-wise, why would you ever side with Nova? He's so much cooler than she is. I like him. He's He's good. And then we got Tychus. I think Tychus is one of the best written characters in Wings of Liberty. Apparently in the original draft, he was a pretty bad character. In like he was just a jerk and stuff all the time and people didn't like him. And then they did a pretty major rewrite with him to make him more of a character that we can relate to and be like, oh man, he's in a bad situation. I feel like he's not a nice guy but he also probably doesn't deserve to be in this situation. When he gets the Odin and stuff, he's also a lot of fun. Like every scene with Tychus is either A, intriguing, or B, fun. And that is, I honestly, I think he's the best character in Wings of Liberty. He just, he really, really fleshes out the Hyperion crew in a great, great way. Well done. Uh, Valerian, Valerian's interesting in that he's kind of boring. <laughs> uh, I feel like it's weird that he came from such a colored background and doesn't really have a whole lot to say about it. Like, he talks a lot about his father, but he doesn't say anything that's that valuable about him. He's just like, my father was a bad man, and I'm going to be a good man and a good leader. And it's like... I wish, I wish there was a bit more grayscale to him. Like, wouldn't it be interesting if Valerian was a really good guy who genuinely wanted the best for people, but when it got really stressful, his inner minx came out? Just a little bit, you know? It wouldn't be like full authoritarian, but just like, it's like, oh, he is his father's child. Like, he wants to better himself, but he has that, natural bit and then it became like a fight of nature versus nurture type thing how does he become the character or how does he become the leader he wants to be instead of the one that he kind of snaps to during times of pressure something like that would have been really interesting with him they didn't do it but i think overall he's a fine character so i'll give him that beat here another character who i just think is fine is vorzun vorzun as a character doesn't have a whole lot of personality and often just serves as a person for Artanis to talk to to get exposition about other things. And she talks about her mom a lot. And Rashigal was a cool character. I'll give her that. However, I don't know. She's not like majorly exciting at any points in time. I would give her mid B tier. Or rather mid C tier because I guess she's not really a big focus point of a lot of things. And she doesn't really grow much. She just kind of exists. She doesn't feel like the matriarch of the Dark Templar. I don't know if that sounds weird, but like, from what, I guess from the amount of time that we get exposed to people, it feels like Zeratul should be more of the leader of the Dark Templar, and it felt like Rashigal was more the leader of the Dark Templar. And Vorazun doesn't feel like that. 
it kind of feels like they wanted to go for a character that was young and inexperienced and put into this difficult situation, but at the same time, she's like 600 years old or whatever, so get with the picture for it soon. Come on. I don't know how old she is, but all the Protoss are super old. Horus Warfield. I like Warfield. I do. I... Th uh, the biggest negative against Warfield is that Char was too early in Heart of the Swarm. Because... In when you're originally introduced to him in Media Blitz, he's you're like, oh, it's just some general guy. Okay, whatever. He's gonna be Mexico's lapdog, and then he comes down and he sees Jim absolutely being awesome on Char, and he's like, all right, well, you know what? I respect you. I'm going to cede authority to you for a bit as I get my arm replaced with a freaking gun because I'm that badass, and that you know what he is. I respect that a lot. And then he takes control of Char. He has, like, the fortifications on Char between the things. And it's implied he done a very good job of controlling Char between Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm. Which is something that they've never really been... No one's been able to do. So he gets a lot of props for that. And then Kerrigan kind of comes in with Zerglings. Zerglings, Banelings, and Aberrations as her only army. And, and like, A moves over him because his part is too early in the campaign. I think that if I were a story designer for Heart of the Swarm, I would have made it so that Char happened like simultaneously to the invasion of Korhal right at the end. Like maybe you go into Char first, you find Zagara, you try to attack the fortress and Warfield wins. Like he pushes you back. The final mission is like a time defense mission as you try to evacuate everyone onto the Leviathan because he's that badass. That's what I would have done. The Gorgons are too much. And then you have to like have someone counterattack Char while you're invading Korhal to keep the Gorgons over there while you finish off Minx. Something like that would have been more interesting. But instead he just dies to Lings and Banes. <laughs> but at the same time, his ending cinematic is so good. I'm giving him A tier. He's just everything he does is cool, man. He's just awesome. Zagara, I'm giving A tier as well. Zagara has one of the biggest amounts of growth for a character in StarCraft 2. She starts off very uh, stupid. <laughs> She's just not very smart. And her as a character learning through not just Heart of the Swarm, but through the epilogue as well, is really nice. And her voice lines in the epilogue are actually really funny. <laughs> she has some of the better voice lines there because she is a character doesn't get how humans work but she's like really trying to understand and she's actively willing to engage on that level just to grow as a both commander and as an individual I like that a lot she's a good character also eight legs if you're a leg man <laughs> you have four times wait how many legs I don't know how many legs a queen has uh, it might just be six well, you can tell that I was trying to make a joke, but I, I wasn't truly living the joke. Zeratul. I... <sighs> this is the thing. Zeratul is a fan favorite character, but he's a fan favorite character because of StarCraft 1. In StarCraft 2, the only thing that the writers let Zeratul do is deliver plot points to people. He's like exposition man. He's like, look into my memories and see the things that happen so that the rest of the plot can exist. That's like, man, it's a letdown. But at the same time, he's Zeratul. He's a great character. And his passing at the end, I think, is one of the most emotional moments in StarCraft II. It's, that cinematic was really well done and completely unexpected for, like, everybody. A lot of us, myself included, thought that Zeratul was going to be the main character of Legacy of the Void before it came out. And the fact that they hid that and then had all that happen and it acted as the driving force for Artanis is very important. But Zeratul himself doesn't feel like he gets to shine as a character in StarCraft 2. And that is... that is sad. Alright, this is my tier list for StarCraft 2. 
Wings of Liberty, Heart of the Swarm, Legacy of the Void, and Nova Covert Ops. No StarCraft 1, no, none of the books, none of the anything like that. Just the games, just the cutscenes, all that, and the uh, other things that are on that uh, level. I don't know what you call the ones that aren't like, I guess they're cutscenes as well. Everything is a cutscene if it's not the main game. I guess the main gameplay counts as well, though. So... That is it. Do I do I agree with all this? I feel like Kerrigan is too low placed. I feel like I was too harsh. Maybe I'll put her low seat here. But at the same time, she annoys me very greatly. Yeah, I think this looks more reasonable. So I'm going to stick with that. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I am sick, so maybe I'm just doing really dumb things. My head hurts really badly. <laughs> I have a major headache. So I'm trying. But I'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace.